Today I'm speaking with Merrick Doyle. Merrick is a functional nutritional therapist based in London who has spent the last 13 years working with over 2,000 individual clients, building his model of personalized nutrition informed by data, not dogma, as he himself so eloquently puts it. You can find out more about him on his website, MerrickDoyle.com, where he writes insightful and well-researched articles on all things human metabolism. Or you can book a consultation if you yourself feel considerably worse than you would like. He is also found on Instagram at Merrick Dole Nutrition, if that's what you prefer. Merrick is a fascinating guy, and I find his model of the human metabolism to be one of the best, if not the best, current explanation out there of what often goes wrong with our bodies and how to fix it when general healthcare has sent you home with a consoling, you're perfectly healthy after a random blood test, although you feel like absolute shit. I've worked with him for years on my own health issues and to a large extent have him to thank for having the energy to start this podcast in the first place. He also happens to have a great accent, which might be even more important. Unfortunately, we had some issues with background noise and Merrick's headset dropping in and out of the recording a bit, but... Thanks to our wonderful brains effortlessly filling in the gaps for us, I thought it was definitely worth releasing the episode anyway, as there was a lot of gems in there. So I suggest you sit back and relax, or, well, I guess you could stand or lie down too. In any case, I give you Merrick Doyle. All right, I'm here with Merrick Doyle. Merrick, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So uh, you're British, and I thought I would have to ask you if you uh, if you watch Love Island. I can't say I have ever felt drawn <laughs> to uh, that particular show. So uh, sadly, I know roughly what it's about. But the more I hear, the even more repelled I feel. Wow, okay, because my wife and I are quite enamored uh, by this show at this point. It's, it's not only intellectually stimulating, as you can imagine, but it's, um, the, the narrator is absolutely amazing. And he's basically spending the whole episode just... Well, you need to tell yourself to justify watching it. Yeah, <laughs> no, but he's... Uh... <laughs> Going to be uh, signing up anytime soon. <laughs> well, he's he's uh, roasting the uh, the participants the whole the whole time through. So it's that alone makes it uh, makes it very interesting. Well, I'm sure it would be difficult not to if describing yeah their their general uh, goings on and their life choices. Uh, I think uh, that's that's the only uh, only way it can be handled. Well, maybe if you uh, if you play your cards right in life, maybe you'll end up there on on the show sometime. <laughs> I mean, you sh- shouldn't sell yourself short, you know. There have to be a distinct difference in my card playing for that ever to be a possibility. <laughs> All right, fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I I thought we could start by you just giving us uh, a little background there on who, on who you are, what it is you do, and, and how you ended up there, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, so I am a nutritional therapist, and I have been since 2005, and I was very happy, pumped up, and enthusiastic in the early stages, and was very proud of the results I was getting in fat loss. So it was athletes, members of the public, uh, and anyone in between. And Mm. the only difficulties that crossed my path was that some people weren't getting as good results as the others. So that was something. Fast forward to 2007, I'm training hard, really hard. I'm getting in late from that. I'm waking up early to do uh, sessions before work and undertaking the stress of setting up a a business and essentially doing all the things that I recommend others not do. And I picked up a trivial injury in training, um, but 
it was enough to floor me. And at that point, I was not in a good place. I struggled picking up a 10 kilogram weight in the gym the following day, which was very, very unusual at the time, at least. And that is <laughs> where I was forced to look at, well, what's, what's going on here? And yes, I spoke to the doctors and was uh, shooed out of the office being told how healthy I looked. Uh, yeah, thus I was forced to undertake the first proper deep dive, which is where I really connected with the role of the adrenal response in my symptoms and augmenting that allowed me to feel good again. Uh, but it also then left me with a legacy, not only of realizing how basic the current mainstream narrative is in regards to healthcare, but also with this framework of how the adrenal uh, response could influence uh, the, the metabolism and impact on people's responses. And suddenly I'm starting to see that in a whole load of people. And suddenly those individuals who weren't getting results, we ran some tests, we applied the appropriate responses and now they are getting results. And at that point, those people speak of this change to others, they come running in and suddenly I'm seeing a bit more of a complex population. Mm. And yes, some of them are getting results based on what I'm doing, but there's some that aren't. And that's where I'm having to go deeper. But of course, going deeper yields further insights. And maybe we're looking at mitochondrial function. Maybe we're looking at hormonal status, the conditions in the central nervous system, or we're looking at the regulation of various minerals, so on and so forth. But, but bit by bit, I'm being sent through word of mouth a, a progressively more complex population and right. i'm being forced to build a more comprehensive model of uh metabolic nutrition and here we are uh <laughs> 2020 and uh yeah it's it's been a journey and most of my work now is focused on the complex metabolic conditions the ones for which nothing is working, except, of course, we find that when we actually start measuring key areas, uh, that these individuals have never had a fair chance. But, uh, but yeah, so that's a thoroughly summarized journey that this is <laughs> lots of massive steps. Right, right. Them. Yeah. No, okay, that's great. So, uh, so you were, you were, prompted by your own health issues to look deeper into these areas. Well, I, I suppose that is a great way to, uh, to generate internal motivation to really get good at, uh, at what it is you do. Yeah. Say that most research is me search and yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the, the name for the episode. I love that. But um, so, so I just want to flag real quick there because I, I'm not sure uh, how much background knowledge uh, the listeners are going to have when it comes to health and nutrition in general, since this is not a, a, a pure health podcast in any sense. So I, I thought, uh, could you just briefly explain what the adrenals are, as they are a very central part of, of uh, the clientele you work with? The adrenals are walnut-sized glands that sit atop of both kidneys. And although their size is obviously quite modest, their influence on the human metabolism is rather staggering they're responsible for pumping out the stress hormones that help us cope with stress and that can be all manners of stress uh, but we're generally looking at a anti-inflammatory impact a boosting of blood sugar levels between meals control of blood pressure and availability mm. of alts as well as coordinating thyroid response, testosterone, estrogen, huge interactions there. And there's messenger functions for various pathways in the liver, the central nervous system. And so, yeah, the, the influence on mood, energy, focus, resilience, sleep, 
there's a huge uh, role for the adrenals to play. And generally speaking, they do that quite fantastically. But if there are any metabolic disturbances that impact on their performance of these duties, or if there's any sustained overactivation that demands too much of them, normally the two of those things put together, that is often where we can start to see some problems. Um, most likely to manifest as people less able to handle the stresses that they rose to before. Uh, right. Finding that sleep wake cycle is going amiss, that they are no longer able to retain fluids, they're peeing more regularly. Uh, they're finding maybe dizziness upon standing. Suddenly they're getting drops in their energy and focus in the afternoon. Generally feeling a bit tired but wired, not quite fully awake in the day, not quite fully asleep at night. I mean, that's just a little sample. But yeah, these are the sort of things that for me does scream a need to take a look at the adrenals and what are they doing and what should they be doing. But so is this something that it might be hard to say? I don't know uh, if there's any data on that, but is is this common adrenal dysfunction? Is it common within the the average population, so to speak? Or is this just a symptom for, for people who has uh, more longstanding issues like chronic fatigue syndrome or, or things like that? Well, that is a really relevant question, one that I probably cannot answer. It's very common in the people that come and see me. It's right. something I would expect to see. Um, and by that, I should probably point out that we're not looking at a digital setup of either excellent adrenal function or broken adrenal function. There's always a very nuanced spectrum. Um, in, in that regard. But yes, I would expect there to be some maladaptive adrenal response in anybody that comes to see me. Uh, if that isn't the case, then why would they be coming to see me? Then, then it is fantastic when you when you really start to delve into the, the moments where temporary health challenges become chronic and there's actually mm. the Dutch research uh, 2015, which actually highlights a unpairing of the demands placed on the adrenal glands and the response from the adrenal glands. Uh, they, they actually identify the unpairing between those two things as the moment when health challenges become chronic unwellness. So, yes, right. it makes sense that I'm going to see that in nearly everyone that I work with. But the bigger question is, well, how many people are going to be seeing some sort of dysfunction in the wider population? Because I don't get to see them and I don't get to measure them. Uh, that being said, sometimes when I'm testing the athletes, sometimes when I'm testing friends of friends or family members, that's where I'm able to start building ideas as to what's going on. And it is fantastic. To, to see what is uh, the, the situation there and how there's definitely a lot of people with some form of adrenal imbalance, but it doesn't cause them big enough symptoms for them to want to take action or to feel need to take action, which is probably more accurate. So how would you define your clientele then? What's the most common person who, who shows up at your doorstep to, to get your help? I must confess that it's been about six years since I did one of those you know, good practice uh, questionnaires as to you know, who are you, how did you find me, and uh, what, what's the story so far. But when I uh, did that then, the average number of practitioners that each individual had seen before me was seven and a half. So oh, wow. that sums up the average uh, intake as such. And whilst the, the names and the sticking points, the exact symptom clusters will always tend to vary, 
I think we could say these are people with complex metabolic illnesses that don't appear to respond to the various protocols that they've trialed. And they've trialed some very legitimate, very well thought out protocols, protocols that should work, but yeah. they aren't responding. So it's my job to say, why are they not responding? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I feel like on the face of it, if you're desperate enough to go to seven practitioners and then go to a half a pr practitioner, then you must be really desperate before you go to you. So on. Um, exactly. Well, when half a practitioner has failed, clearly I'm the next port of call. <laughs> all right. All right. No, but that's great. So now we have a little background of you and what it is you do. So I thought we could get into, uh, try to paint a... Uh, general overview of your model here uh, of the human metabolism. So I was looking at your website where you write about your approach here. And I thought I'd read a little uh, from the beginning here because I thought it was good. You said that uh, you have worked with 2,100 individuals over the last 13 years. And that in this time, you have learned two main things. Primarily that there is no perfect way to do things. And that there is no one method to help everyone. However, you do put emphasis on certain biological systems that are relevant in all cases. And you outline six principles here that uh, should always be followed. So I thought maybe you could go over each principle uh, and just give us the, the overview there. Okay, so... Well, yeah, I think probably the the starting point, yeah, is to to recognise that the one thing that I would say I have been taught repeatedly from all the the various responses I've measured is that this idea of what is good is mm. very very problematic. People often ask me, is milk thistle good for liver detox or is carnitine good for mitochondrial function? And those are very common questions across the wider sphere of the, you know, the, the world wide web of uh, various uh, nutritional and metabolic approaches. People want to know what's good and what, yeah. what works, what However, the question I think is that well, when is something likely to work? Um, so to give you an example, maybe I see John and I see James and they both show almost entirely similar clusters of symptoms. And yeah, I can see the, the signs of mitochondrial issues. Uh, I can see the signs of adrenal issues. But they could actually have totally different obstacles manifesting as the exactly the same thing. So mm. John is actually super low on vitamin B1. Uh, and he's really low on B1 because he's exposed to mold. And that has uh, operated as we'd expect it to as an anti-B1 factor, anti-thiamine factor. And yeah, his B1 status is absolutely destroyed. Now, it just so happens he needs B1 to make use of carbohydrates in the mitochondria. It just so happens he needs B1 to form a uh, compound called NADPH. We don't need to worry about uh, these acronyms. <laughs> what we do need to worry about is without the NADPH, you can't effectively form cholesterol-based hormones, which includes cortisol, DHEA, testosterone, estrogen. So, of course, it's inevitable that just from this one major hit that he's had from living in a mold-infected uh, flat, masses of issues. And then from that point on, the adrenal response leaves him unable to, to, to mount an effective response each day. And there's inflammatory consequences when his response don't meet requirements. Mitochondrial activity means that suddenly his brain can't quite work the way it should. 
the cells that require energy for everything can't quite do what they should and everything starts to fall apart from there on in. Now he's James and James has just told him that he's, he's come and seen me and that I did an organic acids test and um, it showed that he was short in carnitine uh, but it also showed that he was desperately low in B12. That would have meant that uh, James couldn't burn fats in the mitochondria. Carnitine is required to do so. There was other mitochondrial issues as a result of the B12, and that B12 further caused issues elsewhere in the methylation cycle, which meant that certain compounds, I'm going to name it, homocysteine, then built up <laughs> and impacted key structures within his adrenal cells. And so he too has almost identical issues but for totally different reasons. And he's raving at John, so you've got to try all this carnitine and beads. It's such a game changer. I'm, I'm alive again. I can do stuff. My days are so different. It is just a, a, a absolute bridge to a new world. And of course, John tries it because how could he not when his pal has shown through his own responses how good these two items are but the problem is predictably they don't do a thing for john because he wasn't low in carnitine and he wasn't low in b12 mm. he needed be one now um of course uh it's obvious when i lay it out in that sense the problem being of course is that the entire focus of allopathic medicine is on measuring the impact, uh, or should I say the average impact of a particular intervention on a particular pathway and then attempting to declare that effective or not effective without actually considering that well, there can be uh, a certain chunk of the population being studied that need a totally different support to other parts of that population so that's that's the biggest thing not is something good but when is something likely to work right now i think that's a very important point and if you look at general health care it seems like they're doing the complete opposite there they're they're mapping symptoms and trying to treat the symptom in this yes. case john and james had the same symptoms but they're not looking at the underlying causes which makes for a very problematic approach if you actually want to get better. Well, yeah, hugely. And it's really not an issue if it's something that's entirely specific. For example, it's a genetic disease where we know a particular um, step in a specific pathway is, is the rate limiting factor in the symptoms. But when it's a syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, or POTS, uh, post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, muscle activation syndrome, you think it's a ridiculous model to follow that, well, the average response across these 120 people studied was you know, a, a plus 30% um, in this particular marker. That's not very useful for any of the single individuals. Um, yeah. And there's this very worrying assumption that the average response yielded of those 120 people can somehow be applied to any one of those. But yet the average response, depending on how many significant figures we break it down to, not a single one of those humans, in fact, no single human being ever has ever responded in that way. And yet, we're providing treatment on the basis that that's how humans respond. Yeah, I mean, that, that ties into another principle you have here where you write about um, evidence-based evidence -based medicine based on relevant evidence. And uh, you say that, that you will always be guided by science but not limited by it. And I found this very interesting. So could you explicate what you mean by that? So, yeah, so ties in with what we were, were talking about just now in that evidence-based medicine is what we would call frequentist in its approach. It assumes 
that there is one correct answer, that there is one correct figure that can be generated to predict the response to B12 or any other uh, intervention. Um, mm. And that all we need to do is employ science effectively and do enough studies and in time we will have a correct figure. The yeah. problem is that you know, it's actually very, very simple to break apart the real issues here. Let's say you do a study on 20 people and it's on B12. Uh, 20 people with chronic fatigue syndrome, we want to see uh, will there be a improvement in the inflammatory profile of these individuals. And we just choose a particular marker. Maybe it's an inflammatory cytokine like IL-1, interleukin-1. So we take these 20 people and we give them 5,000 micrograms of B12. Then we measure their changes in inflammatory markers. Well, it turns out seven of them saw a drop. Six of them saw an increase and six of them, no, seven of them, in fact, because <laughs> yeah. seven of them. let's get the math right. Seven of them actually saw no change. <laughs> what does that tell us? Well, according to evidence-based medicine, there is zero effect. Now, it just so happens that there's seven people that can stand to greatly benefit from this intervention, but evidence-based medicine says, yes, but when we generate the right figure, when we do meta-studies and combine multiple studies, we determine that actually there is no impact, there is no effect. It is ineffective. Now, of mm. course, it's totally irrational that here's something that can measurably be shown to have a potent improvement in the quality of life, the inflammatory markers, various other outcomes in a third of that group. And yet, because of the limitations of evidence-based medicine that is so passionately focused on generating an average figure, an average response, well, at this point, the average is nearly zero no effect on average even though we know for a third of people this may well be a crucial part of what they need to get well that's the single biggest limitation of evidence-based medicine and i think the second one is assuming that the average results um, and the population studied has any relevance to all individuals that i see so if I see an individual who shows low cellular levels of B12 and I can see that on their test, well, do they have any relevance to the 24 students that didn't have a B12 deficiency? Um, yeah. The, the studies. It's a very, very different population. And so trying to extrapolate the uh, observations from what, what was measured in the lab and trying to apply it to this one individual who's 30 years older, uh, different gender, has been a long-term sufferer of chronic illness, has an entirely different schedule, entirely different diet, and has been shown to be B12. Well, there's multiple factors that make that research non-applicable. Um, so in that sense, I want to use the research as a proof of concept of what can be seen what can be done with each in the in intervention but certainly not to assume that that is what it does yes and without getting too deep into this rabbit hole while still acknowledging that this podcast is mainly about epistemology evidence-based medicine as an idea is still based upon the faulty idea of empiricism and inductivism that we can just derive theories from the data and that that's the source of our theories that rather than acknowledging that uh, the role of science is not to collect data to prove theories it's actually to explain the world and there is a role for data and so-called evidence but it's to choose between already guessed uh, theories rather than creating them in the first place. We're not trying to prove theories right. 
were trying to effectively prove them wrong with the data falsifiability and yeah in that sense um yeah it just seems so odd that we're trying to prove uh that intervention x has um a 22 percent improvement um in condition y which has only been loosely defined by symptoms rather than mechanisms which yeah we're um we are struggling and I, I actually heard. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard um, someone mention that when they do the clinical trials for different medications, for instance, the reporting of symptoms, they do not differentiate the symptoms the patients in the study had before using the medicine and after. They conflate these two. So the long pamphlet you get with all the possible side effects, uh, it's very, very hard to discern what's actually caused by the medication or what was already there before. And uh, that adds to the confusion here. Well, there's the standardization and, and the reporting. There is a very obvious disconnect between the considerations we'd make when working with a human being in order to do what we need to do to help them feel better, perform better and overcome the challenges they're facing. Well, that, mm. that's going to involve, yeah, lots of gathering of data, including, well, what did you notice before and what was different afterwards? That's absolutely vital to the clinical process. Yeah. We're going to then use scientific data to inform that particular process. It would be nice for that scientific data to have some sort of uh, reconciliation with what we want to know and unfortunately there isn't much of an attempt to do so so this is where yes i you'll see from my articles and uh, my various musings that i am constantly referring to the science but i'm not extrapolating the outcomes of particular studies as proof that any given intervention will work it's proof of concept that it can work um, and then it's up to me to screen this individual for what separates them from these interventions. Is there anything additional, any additional challenges that they're facing that would stop them from responding in the way we want them to, the way that the study participants uh, responded? Equally, um, is there something that may well allow them to get more of an effect is this something that's going to have a bigger impact in these individuals? And that's where the mechanistic reasoning and substratification of the, the populations is so important until we substratify to a population of one. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I thought another interesting principle you were talking about in this uh, on your website here was the three basic stages. Uh, mm -hmm. in any healing journey there. So you outline the dysregulated plus burdened, and mm -hmm. then you have the, the burdened stage and then the unrestricted uh, one. Yeah. So what are these three and, and yeah, how do you utilize them? So yeah, so they can broadly be uh, correlated with, with the ideas of homeostasis. Um, so homeostasis is a phrase we use to describe a state of adaptive balance, a state in which the human has, um, yeah, sufficient resources to adapt to the environment around them and maintain current well-being and future health and all is good. They are balanced. They are in tune. Then, of course, we can compare that to allostasis, which is a very interesting uh, stage in that this does represent balance. This is a altered state of balance, but a state of balance nonetheless. And it's altered because the body has compromised its investment in this particular project that ongoing healing process, um, this energy drain. It, it's, it's reallocated its resources to best handle the challenges that it perceives in the environment. So this is one whereby 
you only get four hours sleep one night. But that's okay because your body then activates the adrenals more, pump out more cortisol, pump out a little bit more adrenaline. And so whilst it's not the optimal balance long term, whilst having higher levels of those hormones is inevitably going to impact on various healing processes, bone regeneration, it may impact on the investment that you make into the digestive process. It Mm. may even start to tinge on the investments that you make into activating the prefrontal cortex so that you're not quite as sharp, not quite as bright that day after you've only had the four hours sleep. But hey, you are totally capable of discharging all your duties that day. It comes at a cost, but you are sufficiently balanced and you have adapted to the challenge placed on you by having very little sleep. And that's a perfect example of allostasis. You are subject to an infection where your body takes away energy from the muscles. And that's one of the reasons we get the, the very characteristic aching uh, in our, our muscles whilst we're in a fever. Um, but it's, it's withdrawn energy from those areas in order to invest that in the immune response. Another a perfect example of a balance that's appropriate for the circumstances. So that's allostasis. It's one whereby you your body is handling the challenges. It is um, maintaining good levels of function. Uh, but at a cost. Um, and in most people's lives, yeah, they're, they're actually operating in allostasis. Um, they are maybe not sleeping quite as much. They're maybe not quite giving themselves the time off. But hey, compensations are being made and the costs need not be paid today. Now, of course, then there's a third stage, astasis, total lack of balance, uh, which I think is most easily deemed as the emergency zone where the body is no longer uh, making compromises. It's no longer reallocating resources to best handle the demands placed on it. It is now taking everything it can. It's no longer a disproportionate compromise. You know, this stress response right now this immune response right now is hijacking your metabolism in a desperate attempt to stay alive right yeah these three stages of what i have put on the website and referred to as um, unrestricted as burdened and dysregulated and it's so important to think of these things because it's it's a concept which i think we can all understand um that you can't meditate whilst running from a tiger (laughs) or capture that but yet there are a lot of people that i work with whose limbic systems the the area within their brain that's responsible for coordinating an appropriate physiological response to a threat. These limbic systems are stuck in outright overdrive. They are in a state of astasis, total imbalance, um, whereby the limbic system is hijacking their metabolism to better aid their survival right now and screw the consequences, screw the costs, because at this stage, the limbic system perceives that there may well not be any costs if it doesn't uh, summon up all available resources to get ready for the fight. Uh, it determined is about to happen. So right. it's scenarios that I'll often have people come in to my clinic for the first time. And suddenly it becomes irrelevant what uh, protocols they've trialed because the body isn't trying to heal in these scenarios. It's trying to survive. And so undertaking intermittent fasting, undertaking antibacterial, antifungal steps, undertaking detoxes, trying to switch on methylation, trying to, um, I mean, the key thing is, okay, valerian. Very well-characterized herb. It's been around for 
thousands of years, and it's a very reliable herb to aid in sleep. Just one mm. problem. If you were being chased by a chainsaw-wielding maniac and you popped a valerian, <laughs> it's not you to sleep because <laughs> stimuli arriving at these control centers of your brain, the limbic system, that obligate it to mount an emergency response, pumping out shed loads of adrenaline to keep you alert on the threat in front of you, or well, let's hopefully, uh, hopefully it's behind you, <laughs> um, but also making sure that there is a major dump of stored energy resources from muscles, from liver, but also opening up the gut lining in a desperate attempt to just get any sugars and salts that are there, get them into the uh, into the bloodstream. And it's effective. You do get more sugars and salts in, but at a massive cost because those deliberately opened channels will now also let in endotoxins, little fragments of the uh, bacteria. So it's not the bacteria itself, but it's fragments of dead bacteria. And they'll be found in any gut, admittedly. Dysbiosis and imbalance in the intestinal microbiome can mean that there's more of these endotoxins. But any gut's going to contain endotoxins. The key event that sees and causes problems is that opening of the gut lining. And, And with that, well, guess what? Your immune system is now exposed to this massive wave of non mammalian DNA. This only happens in infection, or at least that's the uh, the conclusion that evolution has allowed the human immune system to make. And of course, it mounts a massive inflammatory response against that, which is going to impact on mood, on your mitochondrial activity and uh, various um, points within the, the central nervous system, certain structures will become overactive in those instances, uh, certain structures will become underactive. Suddenly, you know, this is happening all day, every day for somebody. And yeah, yeah it's just legitimate to say, you know what? I tried a thyroid based protocol, didn't do a thing for me, actually just made me more wired. Well, yeah, I mean, thyroid and adrenaline are going to be highly uh, uh, similar and actually have complementary effect in the cardiac muscle. So, yeah, palpitations is uh, something that we're very likely to see in those instances. But I just throw that out as a single example. If your is is throwing all its resources towards staying alive and has disregarded the, the healing project temporarily, of course, that temporary uh, disregard has now lasted years. There's not a single protocol on our earth that's going to work. So in this instance, uh, the conclusions a lot of people make is, well, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Nothing works for me. And it can be a source of hopelessness, which in itself can further stress her. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people I have heard from, they will get in touch on the basis that I have long given up hope. But a friend I met at a support group a couple of years back has just dropped me a line and has explained what you two have done. And I'd like to give it a go myself. And in all cases, the starting point is to take the individual out of that emergency state. In other words, to put them in a state where healing is actually possible and then consider, okay, now that it's possible, what metabolic things are actually blocking it? And that's where my work comes in. Again, not to heal anyone, to identify and eliminate the obstacles that are stopping their body from healing. Right. Yeah. So so this dysregulated state where you are in emergency state all the time uh, it, it could be analogous to let's say you're uh, you have credit card debt and then you try to pay off the credit card debt with another credit card and now you're thinking maybe this is a good time to start saving for my pension or start investing in stock or something it's not the right time to do that 
exactly that. Um, and so, yeah, in that sense, there's such, there is such a consequence. And actually, I do see that uh, um, analogy playing out when people leave the emergency state. And there just isn't anything really available on this particular problem, but it's a problem that almost everyone I work with will encounter at some point, should they begin in an emergency state. And, and by the way, we can actually identify the emergency stage, not just based on, on sleep uh, and general vigilance um, and symptomology, although that certainly helps, but also looking at things like heart rate variability, which allows us to yield a figure, a quantitative idea of how activated is this individual's nervous system. We can also look at their adrenal response. There's, there's markers that we can use to very fairly and uh, objectively identify who's in this stage and that's really important because when you provide the item that is key for removing the obstacles when you when you provide that support that's key to move them out of emergency that's the one where they are likely to struggle because suddenly They've lived their life in an emergency state for, let's say, five years. That means higher levels of adrenaline. Funnily enough, a lot of these individuals, they feel normal. They don't feel what I would feel with the same level of adrenaline. Why? Because year by year, their adrenaline receptors have become desensitized. Mm. If you have five times the amount of adrenaline, but only 20% of the sensitivity to it in the areas that affect your thinking, your mood, and um, your, your fat burning response, for example, well, that's going to feel normal. And that's the key. Whatever's normal for you is normal for you. But then take that adrenaline down by half suddenly these people are going to feel sluggish. They're going to actually be unable, physically unable to access uh, full um, activity in certain cortical areas. So they'll be foggy. Their mood will likely be affected. And not only that, they may well find that they've got a bit of weight. So... They've come to a nutritional therapist with high expectations. Maybe they've seen the highlight reel of, of their friends. Uh, somebody they thought, like them, would never see such improvements. But they have done. And, of course, they ask, well, what made the difference? And the, the individual explains to them, there's this that I brought in. And, oh, what a difference. But... Mm. Of course, we always forget that horrible moment where you've gone from this wired up emergency state to one whereby, yes, yeah, suddenly you are really sluggish, really off the pace. And of course, sleep is better, but getting stuff done is actually harder now because you're suddenly in the aftermath. And it's not just that lack of adrenaline, it's also that, that lack of of uh, nervous system activation, that, that limbic response. So that what was previously numbing you is no longer numbing you. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, tool that evolution has equipped us with to handle the stresses, and hence why you always see in the films of the individuals get shot, and they don't notice it till afterwards. And yes, um, um, we, we recently celebrated 75th anniversary of VE Day, and so uh, I've spoken to my my granddad previously about he was shot in the face, in through one cheek, out wow. through the other, missed the teeth. Didn't feel it at the time. Felt it afterwards, of course. But of course, but but that's an extreme example of what is going on with the stress response when 
that's being deployed, we don't necessarily feel things. We are in a highly vigilant uh, state where we are focused on potential threats in our path. Yeah. And it's once, once those threats are over, in the case of car accidents, is once the car comes to a halt, that's when we cry or laugh or get angry with the other driver and start shouting. It's not during. Um, and so, yes, often we have this situation where people have had to come down a notch. And yes, their sleep is better. And of course, they are indeed calmer. But they feel underwhelmed. They're sluggish. They can't think clearly. And not only that, it's quite likely they might start feeling things. Maybe they feel anger. Maybe they feel sadness. Uh, they could also feel joy. They could also feel excitement. Um, those don't tend to be a problem. Um, <laughs> of course, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging zone. But the reason I mention that is because so many people uh, will actually find that this disturbed environment, or should I say this novel environment, is enough to make them highly vigilant, which, of course, is what mammals are designed to do in a novel environment. And nothing affects your environment uh, more so than sensations that arrive in your limbic system and areas of consciousness creation. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's why um, it's so relevant for me to gather data on where people are. What did that do to their heart rate variability? What did that do to other markers? Um, what are the key characteristics of that response that we're looking for? So that we know when people move out of that zone, and they feel a bit weird before they go to bed. Something doesn't feel right. Maybe they struggle to get to sleep. Well, now we can determine, well, it turns out 5-HCP didn't ruin their sleep. It simply took them out of emergency zone. And now they've got a new environment to adjust to. But providing that transition is handled effectively, providing I have warned the individual and... Uh, giving them a roadmap of what to expect. Well, that transition can be smooth. And now, a couple of weeks later, we're starting to see the first signs of genuine healing occurring. And they're actually starting to see real profound shifts. Um, and so there's still a number of things that we're likely to see in that middle stage, that allostasis, that balance at a cost uh, or what I would call the burden stage of course there's still burdens from let's say the uh, microbial burden uh, when there's an imbalance in, in the intestinal populations of bacteria yeast. that's still going to be there that still needs to be dealt with and until it's dealt with they're still subject to a 24-7 inflammatory load so yeah it's there's still uh, some considerations there, but now the body has the capacity to reallocate resources. There, it, it, it has to be taken away from elsewhere, but it can be used for allowing clear thinking. It can mm. be used for investing in the digestive tract. There, there is now investments in areas might be limited, but they're possible. So, yeah, and then we, we carry on the journey in that middle stage. All right, folks, time for the fun stuff. If you enjoy my podcast and you want to support it, you can now become a monthly Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash do explain. Or if you'd rather make a one-time donation, you can visit ko-fi.com slash do explain instead. That is ko-fi.com slash do explain. Perhaps ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And surely Jesus would donate to uh, do explain. Another way to make the podcast grow and improve is to tell people you know who you think would enjoy it to check it out. Because with more support and exposure, I'll be able to improve the podcast continually and produce more content, which is something that I would love to do. Lastly, thank you so much to all of you who've donated so far. It truly means the world to me, and I want to extend my gratitude. Back to enjoying the show. Well, there's a lot, lot there that I found interesting. But so, so one of the things uh, was you said that, yeah, the body is self-healing unless there are obstacles in play. 
And I really like that way of framing it. It's not that you are, uh, you're broken and you need to be fixed. You just need to stop doing the shit that break that, that ruins your body and the body will take care of itself. That, that's a really nice way of thinking about it. But, but also I was wondering, you mentioned how you can't meditate while running from a tiger. And I like that quote. I've, I think I've used it before uh, with another guest, and we had a long discussion about that. But I'm very curious then how, how you see the mind and psychology tying into all this, because it feels like that must add uh, a completely different element to the whole thing. You can't just look at the body uh, in and of itself, because we have human psychology, which in and of itself is extremely complex and will determine a lot of, like you said, it will add to the burden. If you're thinking certain thoughts all the time because you have beliefs of how you're useless or something like that, you will uh, that will affect your neurophysiology and your adrenal output and all those things in turn. So it's just not um, it's not simply a bottom up. Uh, physiology affects psychology. There's a uh, bottom-down influence as well there. So, so how do you, because I mean, you're not a psychotherapist yourself. How do you uh, delegate? How do you determine how much seems to be psychologically driven? Uh, is there such a thing as a client who comes in and is in this burden stage? Or sorry, the dysregulated, the worst stage, the crisis stage. And is completely psychologically fine because that seems to be a contradiction to me. I feel like all stress that is not strictly physically imposed stress as har- like harsh weather or training is emotional stress, is psychologically driven. So, so I'm curious how you view that interaction. Well, yeah, and I think it comes down to that key question of well, what is it? Is it psychology or is it physiology? Um, you know, what should I do? Should I do nutrition or psychology? And the problem with that is that, yeah, as you say, it's impossible to separate the two because um, what what defines pretty much single human being complex metabolic issues is that this increased limbic response, which we could casually refer to as the stress response, we see that that is overactive in 100% of individuals I've ever worked with and monitored with complex metabolics. And that has major impacts on physiology. Uh, the, the deployment of that will inhibit the activity of the vagus nerve. Uh, the vagus nerve is there to essentially monitor your social environment, but also the intestinal environment. In essence, it's a channel uh, that communicates safety, and providing that it's firing well, then it's telling the brain, do not use your precious resources right now because there is no need to mount a defensive response um, and it actually controls both that, that classic stress response that's very centered on the adrenals and, and readying the body physically for physical threats but also on the inflammatory response which readies the, the body for microbial threats um, but yeah so if there is psychological stress that's activating the limbic system, then that categorically is going to influence the the uh, burden, the stress response, the inflammatory response. In all cases, it's just to what extent. But equally, the opposite is true. If there is mitochondrial issues, if there is any postural issues, if there's a lack of the key nutrients involved in, say, methylation, a really vital chemical pathway to form neurotransmitters, well, all of those things can have such devastating impacts on what is physically transmitted to that limbic system. 
and I'm allowed to keep on talking about the limbic system for good reason. But mm -hmm. without trying to um, <laughs> summarize a decades of research in neurobiology, what we know is that there are multiple connections coming into that limbic system. And the limbic system works basically on a voting system. How many votes for go berserk and get ready to fight my way out of this environment? How many votes for chill out and have a nap? And, um, yeah, so those votes are cast ultimately by neurotransmitters called glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's the main excitatory neurotransmitter that switches on our brain. And it's there to help us learn things, to form complex ideas and to complete our sentences, to learn languages. It's, it's heavily involved in anything that involves brain work. Mm. GABA, on the other hand, is there to switch things off, switch off our brain generally, but more often to switch off certain neural networks that are not relevant right now. And that's important because it's estimated that our brains are receiving one billion bits of information at any one moment. And so almost all of that is irrelevant almost all of the time. Hence why GABA is so important to filter out things that just aren't important. And when people have low levels of GABA, which is likely in various metabolic issues, especially inflammation or low B6, it goes on. Um, but in those instances, they are very likely to struggle in loud environments, picking out a conversation in a crowded bar, for example, not that that's a concern right now, um, <laughs> but um, a picking out a conversation at a, a loud barbecue in the coming months. Maybe that's going to be more, more topical. And yeah, it's going to require so much effort because it's they're not able to physically filter out the background noise, meaning the control centers, the cognitive areas need to work harder to then uh, decipher it and um, act on it appropriately. Uh, equally, they're going to really struggle to to sit with, with noises um, and people talking, the background noise of the television, the background start to cut through them. Uh, somebody drops their keys or, or, or there's a noise outside from a bin being blown over. It really hits them. It cuts them to the core. But yeah, so, so that's glutamate and GABA. And I, I mention them because they are so important to the activation of the limbic system because ultimately these are the two chemicals that deliver the net sum of, of the votes counted in areas such as the default mode network, which definitely has been correlated with uh, Freud's idea of the ego. And for good reason, it certainly does show a lot of signs in the neurobiology research of being the key area in which we hold our sense of identity. Um, but Equally, it holds our, our, a sense of what does this sensory input mean for me, mm -hmm. as well as many other things. Um, and so whether that means this is a food or non-food, whether this is delicious or disgusting, uh, whether this is a potential mate or non-mate, but more importantly, is this dangerous for me? Yes or no. And so that operates clearly as a filter. Or sensory information and so that's an area in which our uh, learned beliefs especially in the first four years of life can play such a, a huge role and so if that happens to be contributing to a miscount in the votes that's not something that i'm expecting to solve through nutrition that's an example of something that psychotherapy body mind work uh, breath work um, traditional plant medicines um, can be very helpful to, to ease and, and get around we also know that the prefrontal cortex yes it's the, the most active zone uh, when it comes
comes to solving, thinking, calculating. But it's also heavily involved in mood and it regulates the limbic response. That has a crucial role of just keeping calm in the limbic system. So if that's suffering from a lack of energy, if that's suffering from either an inability to produce energy or it's suffering from an inhibition of the energy production process as seen in inflammation, well, that leaves somebody with a loss of votes for calm. Equally, what if they're short of magnesium? Well, this is a crucial part of the picture because every neural network, in fact, every neuron in the network has these receptors called NMDA receptors, and they exist pretty much as gates to determine that, well, if this isn't important enough now, it's not coming through, it's not going to reach the control centers. Um, and it does a great job, and this is heavily involved. The glutamate and GABA um, essentially vote at each and every NMDA receptor to either allow for the message to pass and to be passed on to the next gate um, or not. Um, so, yeah, if you don't have sufficient magnesium, or you have disturbances in oxygen availability and energy metabolism, then these gating systems don't have the energy to function. Whilst there may well be disturbances in the firing as well in these low energy states, suddenly we're having disturbed firing, lack of control of what comes through, add inflammation to the mix, which is very well established to uh, induce higher levels of that glutamate, higher levels than the, the brain really wants, then you increase the firing uh, or, or the tagging of a dangerous thing, the vote of danger coming in from that um, default mode network. And then, yeah, take away the, the energy metabolism and the prefrontal cortex, which was otherwise providing that calm effect. So suddenly we start to see there's so many ways that physiology can leave somebody without a fair chance of ever feeling calm. Um, and yes, of course, the psychology can then contribute to that. Um, and, and I've only really spoken about the prefrontal cortex, the default mode network, the role of glutamate, GABA and NMDA receptors. We're not even looking at the, the cerebellum um, and physical tension, uh, which is a thing that can play in to these votes that eventually arrive at the limbic system. Uh, oxygen delivery from postural issues, massive role to play. Inflammation and an area of the brain, brain called the anterior insula, uh, which some researchers have linked with worst case scenario thinking. Uh, the role of cortisol in the anterior cingulate cortex and the calming effect that has, or, or should I say a coping response uh, that appears to be played out there. So there's so many inputs the impact on the way these neural networks handle messages. And when things go wrong, we'll often see a dramatic increase in the amount of votes for panic, for preparing for danger that arrive at this limbic system, which is then tasked with doing what it should do, which is to mount an appropriate readiness response. And it's all about getting energy availability um, to meet perceived demand. Um, so, so yes, there's a lot of individuals who simply will not have the fair chance to respond to psychotherapy, uh, meditation, mindfulness, while their physiology locks them, obligates them, into this emergency state because you can't meditate whilst running from a tiger. And if due to maladaptive, imbalanced physiology, your limbic system is receiving a permanent message, well, yes, you know, there will be adaptions made. And it's incredible when I see individuals and, and hear from them who, as, as to how they were so unaware of exactly how stressed they were. And literally, I can reflect on my own experiences in that regard. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, that often means they don't have a fair chance. And so it's fascinating in, in that some people say, well, I've, I've done BT, I, I, I've, I've done traditional Freudian psychotherapy, I've, I've done mindfulness, nothing works for me. And of course, you think the tragedy there is that these could have such a wonderful, life changing impact. If they were deployed at the moment, when the person actually has a chance to benefit from them, um, so that's where the physiology is often key. And in most, the, the single most likely um, outcome. You know, let's not treat people like statistics, but let's give it some context. The single most likely outcome is that I will see people who uh, are in that stage where physiology is the rate limiting factor, and then two, three rounds of, of adjustments in, suddenly they stop benefiting from the physiological support that they should. Because now that um, we've taken away a lot of obstacles, psychology has become the right limiting factor. And that's when I would, uh, I, I've created systems specifically to highlight when that's likely to be the case and a combination of metrics that would point to the fact that now it's extremely likely that physiology has, has popped up as the new rate limiting factor. And that's when I would refer them to another practitioner that specializes in that area. Um, same too if it's a, a postural issue, if they've got a, a, a distorted left right imbalance, uh, posture, then, then yeah, that's automatically going to play a role. How much? Is of course a case of likelihoods, but yes, that's often another common referral that I will make out because if you if you're missing forty two percent of the blood flow to your brain, how could you possibly expect neural function to be optimal? How could you possibly expect to have a fair chance of responding to either the psychotherapeutic approaches or to my nutritional physiological approaches? So I hope that uh, identifies why there's never going to be a defined answer to what's more important, psychology, physiology, and how in anyone's journey, it's always the, the question to ask is what is the rate limiting factor right now? And I say yeah. right now, it will change. I can't fathom that anybody will get from the starting point to the end without, um, yeah, there being a moment that the sensory input that they're now capable of receiving, this novel sensory input that they're receiving from the emotional centers of the brain that's now capable of arriving at the limbic system, are we expecting that 100% of that has been associated effectively with, with, with a adaptive meaning? That seems impossible given humanity. So, yeah. So I'm curious. I think this is a very fascinating area, the intersection between psychology and physiology. And do, do I understand you correctly? Are you saying that psychology is to a large extent, especially in these populations that you see, uh, controlled by or determined by physiology? Um, well, there's always going to be an influence. and. For most people that I see at the start, yes, it's controlled by physiology. For most, not all. Um, and for all individuals that I've tracked, there has been a point at which the psychology then becomes the rate limiting factor. And for right. some people, that's been a really big challenge and has called for them to really engage in some quite profound and potentially quite challenging processes. And for others, it's, it's been relatively simple. Reach yeah. a stage where yeah, their, their, their physiological performance of the neural networks can now proceed as, as planned. And yeah, tend to certain things. Yeah, for some people, casual mindfulness is enough. And on they go. They notice this massive shift from 
some physiological support we've brought in. They have a big old cry one evening and then they move on. Mm. It can be that simple. Um, so normally it's somewhere between the two. Normally there'll be, we, we sell us at some point. But yeah, right. um, I can't, it is really impossible to, to provide an, an average journey. But yes, yeah. it's yeah. always key. If you're not considering the role of yeah these maladaptive stress responses, the influence of our default mode network, considering sensory uh, information, as in physical sensations, tagged as something. There's going to be a meaning allocated to them, and it's very Pavlovian in that sense. Yeah, uh, the smell of a shoulder of lamb slow roasting in the oven that has a meaning to my central nervous system it's a very positive one but equally the the noise of somebody uh, treading on, on, on pebbles outside uh, of a, a room in which I'm sleeping in a novel environment that, that has a different meaning so, yeah, that can be potentially maladaptive yeah, I I um I agree with a lot of things you say here and I by no means dispute the importance of physiology in psychology or behavior, but I I want to push back a little on this and play with this because on this podcast before I I'm not sure how familiar you are with um David Deutsch's use of the word creativity. Mm-hmm. I would like you to clarify because Yes. I have listened to his book on Audible, but I've done so before bed, which means I missed. <laughs> right, right, I get it. Yeah, so basically it's, um, he speaks about the capacity to create what he calls explanatory knowledge. So mm-hmm. basically not to go too deep into this, but knowledge in genes, which is what animals have access to, is non-explanatory. The genes, uh, they have survived and the knowledge in the genes uh, is there because it has worked to solve a problem in the environment of of replication Mm -hmm. for the genes. So they have this dumb type of knowledge, uh, uh, let's say. And the animal in question doesn't understand this. There's no entity who has explicit understanding about why something works. The tiger, to use your example, of meditation mm-hmm. there. The tiger has stripes, but it doesn't know it has stripes and it doesn't know why it works. So mm-hmm. if you take the tiger and you put it in an urban environment where it hasn't evolved to survive, the stripes won't work. They won't fulfill their purpose of camouflage anymore. And the tiger mm-hmm. can't do anything about it. Whereas, let's say you and I decide to go out in the forest and play paintball. And for some reason you think it's really cool to wear a red vest because you want to look like Drake or something. And uh, <laughs> because the the backdrop in the forest is brown and green, you're going to be more visible. So you'll get shot more. And mm-hmm. the difference here between you and the tiger is that you, because you have creativity, the capacity to create explanatory knowledge, understanding that wasn't in your genes before, you can understand by creating a theory of why you're getting shot more, that, oh, red, maybe that's making me more visible, and that's why I'm getting shot more. And hence, you can change your behavior accordingly, and you can take off the vest, or you can even hang it as a decoy, or something else like that. So so basically, he draws a distinction between any other life form that we know about and ourselves, where we are the only organism that has this creativity, this capacity to create this new knowledge. And so the parallel that is drawn when talking about the brain or the limbic system, whilst I'll, I would acknowledge that, yes, we do have uh, similar structures that have evolved in the, in the same way, more or less. And so we can speak of them when we talk about how the function, functioning of the brain, if it's working or if it's dysfunctional or so. But when it comes to minds... I think that it's um, that's where the parallel stops. And that's when it comes to voluntary behavior in humans, variants of voluntary behavior. I think you can no longer speak 
in neuro uh, biological terms in the sense that you could with an animal and here because when you when you address things like um, let's say what did you say the smell of a roasted lamb or something like that mm-hmm. that meaning to you uh, although uh, of course you're drawn towards certain smells uh, genetically to begin with you also have a very complex interpretive uh, structure that is um, you have a theory whether it's inexplicit unconscious and not in words or actually an explicit theory of, oh, I love that smell because every time I was at mom's house, we would have roasted lamb or something like that. So you have an interpretive uh, structure that is, I would say, is the primary thing that will decide your your behavior in many situations that these animals don't have. They are basically stimulus and response dependent. Certain stimulus, and I mean, of course, it's more complex than that, but if we make a very rough uh, distinction here they have input and then you have certain options that are biologically determined and then they have a specific output whereas a human can always since we have this ability to always make new interpretations and create new knowledge there is there is no way in principle to predict human behavior or write a book about yeah uh, in, in situation x a human is always going to do one of these three things Because we can create completely new options. Like you cannot predict Einstein's creation of the theory of relativity because it's never been created before. It's completely new. Does any of this make sense so far? Because I want to utilize it. And it ties into something that is thoroughly fascinating for me on a personal level. Mm. Um, And... No doubt, yeah, really ties into reams of philosophy over the eons, um, mm. but also helps to explain the difficulties that modern humans have. Because I, I do think it's very interesting when intellectuals who have incredibly strong and well. Uh, developed ideas, they forget that we don't have as many options as we think we have. And that actually, yes, humans can have the ability to to create explanations where explanations did not exist. And there's always going to be some ability for that, but it's often highly limited by the physiology. Um, so in that instance, we're looking to neurobiological research on cognitive dissonance and that whilst certain physiological parameters and basic training um, in the discomfort of holding two opposing thoughts in your mind at any one time um, – yeah, that can have an impact there. In general, humans cannot handle cognitive dissonance. Um, and whether we're, we're simply looking at the impact that that has on, on depression, and, and I can pack that out because it's an indirect but thoroughly potent connection. Um, or whether that impacts on sales and Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, um, which has often been held up as the Bible for salespeople, uh, works yeah. primarily on uh, inducing responses that he calls trigger features of the brain, which then mean the individual can only pull out of the, uh, the upcoming sale by having to tolerate quite unbearable cognitive dissonance. Um, And thus, (laughs) they don't. They buy things they don't want to buy. But the cognitive dissonance is so interesting because uh, if uh, we have any prior Pavlovian associations of a particular stimuli, that it is a danger that is automatically going to limit our ability to analyze anything that that that, that triggers 
that response. Why do people do things that are so illogical for them? Um, <laughs> they don't do it because they deliberately want to harm themselves. They don't enter relationships with people that are thoroughly wrong for them. They don't work 17 hours a day on a, a worthless project um, that will ultimately move pieces of, of plastic and metal um, from one distribution center to another and hopefully accumulate a profit, except it was never destined to do so because the market research was so categorically clear that this was a terrible idea. But yet we do see a lot of people making a logical decision after another. And by a lot of people, I mean everyone. I mean myself and everyone I've ever met. It's just a case of to what extent can we can we rise above? Um, and our physiology does limit our ability to engage with fair cognitive thinking. Um, so in that sense, yes, we do have a capacity that animals don't have. And I, I, I acknowledge that that allows us to make more sense, to provide theories, to create explanations, but to assume that they are constructed in a fair environment is likely to lead to problems because as we look at people going about their their day why would everybody cause so much sickness in themselves and they do we know we don't have all the answers but we have enough answers that we can generate a epicurean life one that does not feature such immense pain but that never happened i agree that physiology is important and it is the case that we are in fact bootstrapped to our physiology as it were and so it's going to influence us and the way it influences us in in my view here is that it can produce sensations for us that we can then interpret and uh, when it comes to voluntary behavior, I'm not disputing that if you put a hand on a hot stove and instinctively pull that away, that was uh, a free choice. It wasn't. It was a reflex. And there are certain states of pain or perhaps of levels of adrenaline or other stress markers where the body will automatically do certain things. But I think that the mind always has... Because of our explanatory universality, we do have a sort of veto power. So explaining our voluntary behaviors in terms of physiology is never going to be the best explanation. I'm just trying to think for myself here. We're one and a half hours in and I'm wondering, I haven't gotten through a fifth of what I thought we were going to go into, which is great. But, but Well, let's move on. But I am going to challenge you at the end of this, uh, this call to jump in a cold bath and submerge yourself in that cold bath for two minutes. Fully submerged. Sure, sure. Now, most people can't do that, nor without training and conditioning, even though they know that this is good for them. Right, yeah. And I can provide the, the research on why that cold exposure is good for the vagus nerve and inducing HSP in your brain and all the protective impacts on your endoplasmic reticulum and so on yeah. and so forth. So yes, I can, I can I provide you these benefits and you can run through PubMed and determine that, yeah, it's all legit. Yeah. <laughs> but why is it that you can't stay on, in a cold bath or a cold shower? Well, I'm going to then, <laughs> first of all, I think you would lose the bet that I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, but on the other, I, I think maybe for most people, not to put myself higher up, but I've been torturing myself with things that people think is uh, unpalatable for a <laughs> long time. So I think I would I would win that on sheer willpower. And I, I, I mean, I, um, I, I, you mentioned Cialdini's book influence and i actually read that recently in a in a class at university and i wrote my my thesis uh or rather a shorter essay on why his ideas in this sense of explaining certain behavior as automatic or or conditioned in humans 
is at odds with our best explanations of how human minds work, our explanatory universality, and also some deducible consequences of the deepest known laws of physics when it comes to universal computation of our brains. But um, <laughs> yeah, this is a really interesting debate. I don't know if we should... It's just- and and maybe we just don't have the cognitive capacities to really fully <laughs> work out here and now in this particular moment we are limited by physiology in making a fully logical conclusion because I too have an emotional desire to cover all of the the subjects that I know we had planned to do. Yeah, um, right, right. So yeah. So, something means saying no to something else yeah all right so let's move on here now we've um we've discussed mostly your your approach but i was thinking maybe we can discuss some things topics like sleep or fasting more in general yeah fasting fasting is very in vogue right now it's very popular and yeah and in health circles it's it's something that is kind of touted as as something almost miraculous. It's it's very healthy in general, provided you do it the right way. And I suppose the most popular version right now, as far as I can tell, is the intermittent fasting uh, varieties. Yeah. So either you do, you skip breakfast and don't eat until lunch, or maybe even sometimes you skip, uh, you eat from dinner to dinner now and again. So you have a 24-hour fast or something like that. And so I was curious... Uh, we know all the health benefits people tout as increased growth hormone or clearance of cells and better resistance to oxidative stress and things like that. But you wrote an article called Intermittent Fasting, uh, Theoretically Great and Normally Stupid, which uh, I love that title. I know you changed it later to, to be a little softer, but I like the original one. And uh, in it, you argue that, and I, I'm not sure if you argue that it's, normally stupid in general for people or if this just applies to your population but i'm curious for you to explicate that a little bit and uh say what you think about fasting for the general person yeah so for anyone who is largely healthy but wants to be healthier and take care of their long-term health then fasting is categorically an excellent tool and right. yeah, most of the benefits center on autophagy, which is the term that describes the, the, the clean out of impaired, aged, corrupted cellular debris. And that seems to be absolutely vital when it comes to mitochondria. Uh, so you have about approximately a thousand mitochondria per cell in most cells anyway. And yeah, the mitochondria are constantly taking the breakdown products of uh, foods and combining them with oxygen in order to form ATP, the body's energy currency. And the more the body wants to do, um, the more tasks that are demanded of the body, then yeah, the more uh, we're going to see those structures work hard. And the only downside of that is that when they work hard, they're subject to oxidative stress, which is not too much of a surprise given they're handling the oxygen. Mm. And so as a consequence, yes, they can often get damaged. Uh, they will actually experience damage to the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, which can result in mutations. And whilst theoretically that can result in improved function, it's generally going to mean that the mitochondria become less efficient, less capable. And that's just not a big deal when it's a small percentage of the available mitochondria. But it becomes a really big deal when it becomes most of the mitochondria because eventually these mitochondria die and in doing so they vote for the cell as a whole to commit suicide. Fast mm. forward this process over decades and now you've actually got atrophy of specific organs 
Uh, now, whether, of course, that's certain cellular structures involved in hearing. Well, that's why people often lose their hearing as they get older, um, because of this ongoing decline in the health uh, of their cells, which is predicated on the health of their mitochondria. And, yeah, whether we see that in, in wrinkly skin, whether we see that in, in as I mentioned, the, the lack of hearing, or whether we see it in uh, changes in, in the eyes or eyesight, so many ways uh, in which this process can occur, and it's often simply lumped into this box that's called ageing. Now, this is where autophagy comes in. So if you undertake a fast... Um, you are initially stressing these mitochondria because suddenly they've got to do more with less. There's no energy coming in and then suddenly you're asking them to maintain normal cellular function. And there's a whole load of changes that go on in, in both the, the cytoplasm, the, the main watery part of the cell, as well as the mitochondria in these circumstances. But the end result is that the weakest ones are unable to do that job as a result of this stress that's placed on them and consequently they die but one of the lovely things about the, the, the fasting and the autophagy response is that as these mitochondria die it actually induces the biogenesis of new mitochondria in other words yes the ones that couldn't keep up died but they're replaced with fresh, new, shiny mitochondria. And suddenly, if you fast forward the, the outcomes that we see from somebody who's never done any autophagy because they're having a midnight snack every night and then a very large breakfast and the eating all day, every day, they're never going hungry there's never going to be a fair chance for autophagy. And thus, this gradual decline in mitochondrial efficiency and therefore, a uh, yeah, you're, you're A, not going to perform as well for many decades, but also you're going to reach a threshold of cellular death quicker. And thus, within an organ system, it, it will shrink. It will not perform the way that it should. It doesn't have the available energy to do so anymore. You'll reach that threshold sooner. Mm. And that's why autophagy, intermittent fasting is so exciting in that it can literally take a organ that isn't working that well and over many rounds make it work better. This is as close to wolverining as we're going to get. <laughs> yeah. So pretty exciting but the problem is this fasting is stressful the beneficial impacts of fasting still require some metabolic competence your body doesn't give a hoot about autophagy and the biogenesis of mitochondria if you're running from a tiger hmm. meanwhile if the stress of that fasting outweighs your capacity to handle that stress for example the adrenal cells uh, they're actually not able to maintain their output due to a lack of a cofactor or due to a disturbance from excessive nitric oxide or a homocysteine etc well, for whatever reason, if they can't maintain an effective stress response, then you are going to have the the endotoxemia response that uh, I, I spoke of earlier, which could have dramatic impacts on increasing oxidative stress to the point that you've you're getting much more negatives than you are getting positives, and so of course. This is another perfect example of why we should personalize interventions and determine of the likely stresses and the likely benefits, how are we expecting both sides to play out in this particular individual in front of me? That's always right. the question. Of course, 
people who feel good are much less likely to look at intermittent fasting because they feel good. People who feel bad, they are the ones that are much more likely to go hunting for things to make them feel better. Uh, people who can't right. lose weight are much more likely to become enthusiastic about stepping out of their normal comfort zones in order to do these things. And that's why people with metabolic disturbances are hugely overrepresented in the groups that trial intermittent fasting. Um, hence why there's a lot of people who are doing intermittent fasting and it's causing more problems than it's providing them benefits. And there are countless people that I sit down with on their initial consultation. And when we take in the case history, they can point to sustained spells of intermittent fasting as the trigger that put them in this spiral that caused them to come and see me or at least start seeking out help, which may, of course, have saw them go to other practitioners first but it's a very common trigger for long-term issues and it's yeah. fascinating it very rarely is uh that they tried it once often they tried it once and they did all right but then it became a thing and gradually the the increased stress burden was, was testing their tolerance their resilience until maybe they did it once they had a cold and that that was it Right, right. So to give just, can you give uh, a few lookout symptoms to look out for if one wants to try that and don't really know if they have the stress tolerance for it or not? Is there an easy heuristic there? The key thing is your ability to harness energy in a fasted state. That is absolute key, not only to protect yourself and your central nervous system from an unnecessary amount of stress, but also to ensure that the energy is used in a way that permits healthy autophagy, which is, of course, the whole purpose of the fasting. So what right. clues would, would, would indicate that there's a problem there? If your body is storing weight when you perceive it shouldn't be, in other words, if you eat a normal level of calories and your body chooses to gain weight in those instances, well, that categorically is a reliable sign that your energy usage has been modified. Now, that may well be a secondary thing. It may well be due to the perception of the need. It may well be due to signaling um, issues whereby the body has become insensitive to insulin or leptin or, or various other hormones that help coordinate a adaptive response to high and low energy states. But in any case, if we're seeing any maladaptive response to handling, storing or using energy, I've got major concerns. If right, right. any difficulties tolerating stresses, so again, we're looking at either the, the limbic system is voting for vigilance at a time that cognitively we can conclude that rest and recovery would be more appropriate. Well, then there's got to be something in there. So yeah, if there's that excessive response to stressors, poor tolerance of exercise, uh, noticing crashes, if you go several hours without eating, inability to maintain regular energy levels over the course of a day, difficulty getting sleep, all of those again would be other clues that any stress may be disproportionately uh, affecting the system and thus we need to keep the gloves on just for now until right. we've actually identified and removed the obstacles that are perpetuating that that limbic response so yeah stress response 
energy management, these are the two concerns. And those hopefully are some reasonable guidelines. If it's a case of feeling all right, have potentially gone off track with the diet for a year, have actually not necessarily tended to yourself, but there's no actual problems and you generally respond okay when you do these things. Those are individuals who are great candidates for fasting. Right. And I think you write in the article something like, if you feel bad, stop. And that's an easy heuristic to use. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and there's a lot of people in between um, for whom they're, yeah, they're not sure. But yes, if you are feeling awful, <laughs> Well, yes, you could go to uh, uh, intermittent fasting forum and get reassurance from your fasting buddies. Oh, that's great. The fact that you feel like you're about to die. Oh, that's a sign of detox. That's great. <laughs> Working. Well, yeah. it's true that some people can experience detox. But if, <laughs> if you already felt like death and now you feel like life is sapping out of you you have the most tremendous headache your skin has come out in some pronounced rashes your digestion is feeling weird and something's up with that i'm gonna call it and i'm gonna say that that probably isn't die off and actually it's another subject together but die off herxheimer reactions they be leveling anyone ever if they are there's more going on than die off so yeah this whole idea of oh it's wonderful you felt horrendous for the last eight months must be die off i guess there was a whole load of toxins in your system yeah uh, i'm just going to put it out there that uh, that might be a flawed strategy yeah so I thought that, since, yeah, since my lack of time management skills have shown through here today, I thought maybe I can do something that people like you who have very deep knowledge of these things might not like, but I'll throw it out there. How about I ask you some questions as yes, no, or true or false, or something like that, and then you can give a short answer. The answers will be, it depends. But let's go. For yeah, it. I would. If okay, let's say you have a gun to your head and you have to choose one of the two. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. So, is there such a thing as sleeping too much? No, categorically, no. Totally ridiculous idea. Oh, that's fascinating. Is there any way to explain that in a sentence or two, without going into details? Have you ever met a human baby? Yes. Even in things like depression, I'm breaking my own rule now. Even with depressive people who sleep like 15 hours a day or something like that. Well, yeah, they're not sleeping too much. The problem is that... They don't want to get up. Yes, there, there is a, a maladaptive drive to do things other than, than sleep. And thus, that occupies more of their time than we should. But the sleep isn't causing the problems. Um, and the other right, example right. that we often see is people saying, I know I only need five hours sleep because I often get nine at the weekend and I feel like a zombie. And to that, I would refer them to an article on my website, which is probably varied from the uh, uh, articles from many years back. But it comes down to one thing. I'll link to that. The drop in adrenaline, right? Uh, if you're living on adrenaline, what happens on those days you take the adrenaline away? You suddenly feel sluggish doesn't mean that you didn't need that yeah. sleep because you're a human. And I would suggest that those people read a book by William Demand in Promise of Sleep, and he'll take it from there. Right. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so the next one is, if you want to lose weight, is it as simple as eat less and exercise more? Categorically, no. Um, if it was, it would have worked. And... Yeah. <laughs> least one study in the 170 years since this idea was first put out there there would be at least one that demonstrates some sort of long-term benefits but you think for the thousands of studies that have looked into this and for the millions or well, probably billions of dollars now spent on trying to prove it it isn't provable because it doesn't work that way 
Right. Oh, that's great. And and uh, so within the population of people who generally are interested in exercise and diet, do you think it's more common to overtrain or undertrain and which one is worse? In those individuals, yeah, definitely it's the overtraining and people confuse the desire to move with the release of guilt for not moving. Um, mm. And that's a conditioning thing. And some might say that the physiological stress response that they get due to the Pavlovian uh, meanings attached to the sensation of not doing things because of ideas that they've accumulated makes them unable to make rational decisions when it comes to should I exercise today? Um, so too, the stress that people face uh, when somebody I mean, asks them to feed themselves effectively. Because the one way we can guarantee a shift in the human metabolism towards uh, weight gain whenever possible and a reduction in calorific usage whenever possible is to undereat for a sustained period of time. And that guarantees that this individual will see changes in both stress hormones and metabolic outputs, uh, conversion of inactive to active thyroid hormones, the activity levels of fat storage enzymes versus fat burning enzymes. To, to think that we, the beneficiaries of billions of years of evolution, uh, would be left with this blueprint that is stupid um, and has no way of adapting to starvation is naive and mm. will generate predictable results. And that's why so many people have difficulty losing weight. And just because you can induce a hormonal imbalance by eating too much, and you can, that's one cause of these uh, difficulties with weight gain. And, and some of those individuals, if it's resolved and, and uh attended to early on, simply just uh, reversing that is enough to see quite pronounced weight gain. But once there are um, imbalances in energy signaling, your body is going to protect your life. Um, and it's going to do that through multiple checks and balances. So you can't trick it with raspberry ketones or whatever supplement <laughs> that you've seen on some questionable website that uh, claims that this supplement is making doctors around the world mad. No, it's not. It's making them laugh. Um, and the reason being, yeah, there's multiple checks and balances and you need to actually allow for clear and adaptive communication in, in the energy signaling department. And you also need to remove um, any signals that would request that the body store more weight as an insurance policy. And that's where the stress thing comes in. Um, the link between stress levels and weight gain is so well characterized. Of course, you won't necessarily hear your Herbalife rep talking about that. But yeah, it, it's a case of if the signals coming into your weight management systems are pleading for you to reduce your uh, your energy usage and to increase your energy storage, the body's going to find a way. Unless, of course, you invoke an emergency and go down to 1,200 calories a day. Well, of course, that's an emergency that it now needs to liberate those energy resources. And sure, that's why you might see weight loss for a couple of weeks. But at what cost? You've yeah. now... You, you've now provided the most strong signal obligating the body to invoke its weight gain machinery the second it gets the chance. So people say, oh, it was my own fault because I broke the diet. I was like, well, how was eating normal calories for one day a bad thing? Why did that use to have no consequence? And now that causes you to store a whole kilogram yeah, that's my slightly expanded yes, no answer. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. It's, I mean, it's a controversial and, and popular topic. But so I, I thought we could end then on, on uh, one that's definitely not going to get you in any trouble. So <laughs> I know what's coming. 
<laughs> so eating meat, especially red meat, is unhealthy. So it's better to be a vegan or a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. True or false? False. Wow, I I, I may, might need a slight expansion on that one. My best friend is a vegan, so I want to give. Yeah, I want him to hear this. This is where we are unfortunately delving into the world of tribalism. This yeah. is the one subject for which you just cannot avoid that, and and it is is difficult because of the camps that tend to have set up around us. Now, I think that most individuals are very capable of recognizing an exclusion diet is one where you cut out a particular food or particular food groups. And there's always a downside to that. It is very relevant that yeah, most areas uh, in which we seek dietary advice we will be continually um coaxed into just making sure that we're not excluding foods not excluding food not 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 removing nutrients and that's something that we hear from mentioned bodies when people go on a grain-free diet which i personally think humans did well enough in the first three hundred ninety thousand years of human evolution um <laughs> the nutrient density of the grains is, is particularly um, yeah, uh, underwhelming compared to other foods. And if you're not eating those, you are eating higher nutrient density foods in their place. Um, but when we transpose that same concern onto, say, the vegan diet, I do think that often, yeah, Instagram influencers are <laughs> guilty. Such of, as yourself. Well, I think I'm a <laughs> thousand followers away from that status um, <laughs> yeah, it, it is something that concerns me that often we're told that um, veganism is good or even that veganism is bad because neither truly captures the impact that that might have on the individual and that's where i think we'd benefit from more rational discussion rather than be hugely motivated to debunk the uh, the heathenous opinion of the other side, to consider, yeah. well, okay, what is the vegan diet not providing and what is the consequence in uh, any given individual? And so, yeah, we often hear, well, as long as you get your protein and there's so many creative ways you get your protein and, uh, and actually it's, it's more delicious. Have you heard that cu- cucumber has uh, 10 times more protein than uh, beef? <laughs> um, yeah, I've heard a few questionable quotes uh, in my time. But um, the, the interesting thing is it's not about the protein and the B12. It's about those things, but it's also about the zinc, the iron, the copper, the taurine, the omega-3s, the carnosine, the carnitine, the CoQ10, the creatine, the choline. We'll, we'll stop there, but there's there's just so many nutrients that we have sourced from animal foods. That is um, the highest nutrient density we can expect, especially organ meat. Uh, I believe it's Chris Press's website that he lays out the nutrient density of liver versus various yeah. uh, fruits, vegetables, which I think is really valuable just to look uh, the cold hard facts there of yeah, the, the 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 nutrients there because yes there is often some cognitive dissonance for people to think that that meat has a higher nutrient uh, density but of course you can select individual nutrients and yes vitamin C for example is something you'll always find in higher amounts in plants but um, this is about like a, a, a compare and contrast across every single essential nutrient. And, and the, the concept that is important is, yes, there's a whole load of nutrients that will not be delivered in optimal amounts if you cut out the most nutrient-dense food group there is. Yeah. And what happens when you do that? Well, what's fascinating is that we know that it will often take unsupplemented vegans years to develop B12 deficiency in some cases and in others 
they start running into problems in a matter of weeks because they were so marginal going into it. We know that there's uh, going to be a dramatic pressure placed on their salvage systems and also on their conversion system. So let, let's take um, omega-3s, for example. So it is true that fishes, uh, oily fish, are a great source of omega-3s, and they provide that in the form of EPA and DHEA, the cosapentanoic acid. Yeah, and, and, and this is the active form of omega-3s that the body can use for uh, various purposes. Now, you can get omega-3s in the form of flaxseed oil and, to a lesser extent, other plant seeds. Um, and those oils can be used very successfully in the body, but they come in the form of alpha linolenic acid. That's not frontline omega-3. That has to be converted through a number of enzymes, delta 5 desaturase, delta 6 desaturase. Eventually, it turns into mm. these frontline omega-3s. Ecosphentanoic acid, ecosphentanoic acid. So great. But what if you have any genetic mutations in the FADS enzyme? What happens if your thyroid output is off track? That's hugely involved in, in that conversion process. What happens if there's deficiencies in magnesium biotin? Again, these are conditional. We can't say exactly what will happen to. Uh, Samantha, when she converts to a vegan diet, as will occur with Sally. Now, if we have our genetics in front of us, well, that suddenly provides us with a better ability to gauge whether she has the genetic capacity to, to handle that. By looking at her thyroid output, we can see if she has the genetic capacity to handle that. Uh, and then there's a whole number of genes, whether it's those involved in methylation, MTHFR being the most famous one, uh, the FUT gene that helps recycle and maintain adequate serum levels of B12. Um, probably the biggest one, uh, the BCO uh, gene. This is what allows us to convert beta carotene from plants into actual vitamin A, otherwise known as retinol. Now, that's something that is really worthwhile laboring because the beta carotenes are not vitamin A. They can be turned into vitamin A. Traditionally, we thought that it was a six to one conversion, six units of beta carotene to turn into uh, one retinol. And actually now it seems it's more like 24 to one. But in individuals with this particular mutation, the BTO1 mutation, we can see a 60% drop in that capacity. So that's big. Added to the fact that that enzyme that we're talking about is actually something that uses bile acids to convert beta carotene into uh, vitamin A. Or you can imagine what will happen if you're in a low energy state and you therefore don't have enough energy to invest in um, the healthy gallbladder function and therefore a, a, a drop in the production of bile. In those instances, you are doubly screwed. 40% of the population have this double mutation on one of them. Congratulations. Thank you very much. But it's not a problem. liver or cod liver oil or lots of oily fish, as long as I get preformed vitamin A in my diet, it's of zero consequence, which is the reason why 40% of the population can have this vulnerability to low intakes of retinol. And it just is a concern. Until, of course, the last 30 years where people stopped eating liver because it's yucky. <laughs> Again, that's a different subject matter. But yeah, just in one mutation alone, you've now allocated 40% of the population that are not capable of maintaining a vegan diet and expecting a good outcome. But then of that 40%, how many of them are free of the FUT, the FADS, the uh, MTHFR, and the other uh, mutations that I, I've, I've just spoken of? Uh, are there more that we are uh, considered? Of? Well, there's going to be more than that. So we're looking at a, a small proportion of the population that I think 
um, have the genetic capacity to withstand um, that that type of nutrient intake. And the only consideration for them is that they now need to avoid anything that impacts on their energy. If it does, we are going to see alterations of thyroid signaling and maybe for the first time they fall excessively short of those omega-3s. We then need to ensure that, yes, they, that they don't have disturbed digestion because, of course, that's so vital to maintain the vitamin A. So, yeah, they just don't have much capacity for temporary disturbances because as soon as, yeah, you reach a moment of vitamin A deficiency, well, you cannot now expect the membranes in your intestinal lining to function in the same way and consequently increased permeability, increased movement of contents of the gut into the bloodstream, the inflammatory process that, that occurs, well, that's now going to impact on multiple areas around the body, including, say, the mitochondria, which are also mm. suffering because they need such strong integral membranes in order to do their job at the electro, electron transport chain. And yeah, vitamin A plays a huge role there. So th there's a point that can very easily be reached whereby you cannot summon up um, the increased um, salvage capacity to overcome it. And now you have entered the spiral that ends in chronic unwellness. So that's why I think there are categorically people who can do very well on a vegan diet. And that's why... Um, for example, I think his name is Scott Jurek, the, the famous triathlete who has mentioned on many occasions that he does eat a, a exclusively vegan diet and has achieved plenty of success. I'm sure there's plenty of individuals for whom that does exist, but what proportion of the population are they? Right. Uh, we know it's going to be decidedly small number. Um, in the same way that, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily base my diet on what Usain Bolt eats. Um, not that I don't like that. Um, but, yeah, just because he eats that and can still perform at an exceptional level does not mean it's right for him. And that's where survival bias comes in, um, yeah. in the sense that for, for everyone, Scott Jurek, is there a thousand failed attempts? Is there... 50 failed attempts is there a million failed attempts and that's impossible to calculate but i'll always go back to uh, a, a comment offered by an author called matt stone in a book diet recovery where he says go back five years and look at the top vegan bloggers also go back five years and look at the top paleo bloggers are they eating that way now um right. and it, it's a very fascinating exercise and so yeah that it is hopefully instructive in why I totally think it's possible, but also why if there's any chronic inflammatory issue, any chronic energy signaling issue, anything that impacts on, on digestion or enzyme function or thyroid activity, that's it. The game is up if you wanted to recover using a exclusion diet of that type. I've never yet seen an individual recover on a, a, a vegan diet. But that being said, like fasting, there can be substantial therapeutic benefits using a vegan diet as a tool. Uh, individuals with sulfur issues, individuals with difficulties handling the digestive load. Um, mm. Yeah, there's you, you can use it therapeutically, but just in, in the sense that I wouldn't want to use fasting as a diet. And we wouldn't recommend the, the vegan diet as a uh, as a diet. Um, so that is my attempt at a dogma free breakdown of the potential benefits and the likely issues with uh, a, a diet that excludes all animal produce. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a very nuanced response, and I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, Merrick, I've uh, you've been very very generous with your time, so I'm going to let you off the hook now and. Um, yeah, it was really fascinating talking to you. I, I appreciate getting to pick your brain. So thanks for coming on. No worries. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good day. Yeah, see you in a bit.